Goeter middag, alle samen. Oh, welkommen. You did bad English, I did bad Norwegian. Thank you for being patient with me while I tried that. I'm very excited to be with you here today. And what a big group. Very pleased you would all join us. I am here to talk about, well, a number of things that are happening. Uh, I've listed them here on the title. We'll talk about hyper-adoption, which I will explain in just a moment. Digital disruption, which I'll also explain. And then what it means for customer relationship. It's a very important topic, and I put the word innovation at the end. Partly because when we talk about innovation these days, we think we're talking about technology. And there will be technology, believe me. But we're not here to talk about technology innovation as much as we are about customer innovation. Let's start. I'll give you an example, and I was very pleased to find out this example was very relevant to you because just across the way, there is a Tesla office. So you will know that back in March of this year, the Tesla Model 3 was presented to the world. Now you also probably know that this car can't be made yet. They don't have a factory that can build it. But they still decided to sell it anyway. So people all around the world here in Norway too, I presume, Within 36 hours, we had more than 276,000 people who had put a thousand dollars, a thousand euros, whatever their local equivalent was, as an investment. Think of this as the world's most expensive Kickstarter project. Over the several weeks, they managed to get a total of 400,000 people who had invested in this car. Now, that's nearly half a billion dollars. If I wanted to make a car and I needed half a billion dollars to do it, well, I would normally go to a bank, an investor. I would have to promise them all kinds of return on their capital. Or if I'm Tesla, I go right to my future customers and I say, I want to build a new car. Will you loan me the money and I'll pay you back by letting you buy the rest of the car. <laughs> That's amazing brand power, first of all. But it's also capturing something that's happening in the world that we live. More than one thing. Three that I'll talk about. This is such an interesting case because 400,000 is a very large number. In fact, it's larger than the number of cars that... Mercedes, BMW, or Lexus sell in their largest market, which is the United States, every year. Last year was one of the most successful years in history for all three of those companies in the United States, and none of them reached 400,000. Now, you're smart people. You know that this is a totally unfair comparison. Tesla didn't actually make or sell the cars they actually made and sold cars. Fair, okay. But this helps me illustrate for you just how different the world is that we live in now. And the companies who know how to take advantage of the different world that we live in now, Tesla and others, these are the companies that have the advantage. But what do they know that these companies don't know? By the way, little detail. Did you know that Mercedes was one of Tesla's first investors. Little historical note. They gave millions to Tesla and said, we like the idea of electric cars, go build one. And when Tesla came back and said, we're going to build a luxury automobile, Mercedes said, it'll never work. We want our money back. And they took their money back. Worst mistake they ever made. <laughs> So what is it that Tesla knew back then and knows now and other smart companies know that the rest of us need to learn? Well, conveniently, the Model 3 teaches us three things. 
I'll illustrate those three things. We'll talk about what they mean. And because we have a little bit of time today, yes, we will go into some detail here. Let's start with the first one, consumer hyper-adoption. Now, hyper-adoption is easy to describe. I simply have to ask you to think about your own life in the last 10 years, maybe even five. How has your life changed? More importantly, how have you chosen to change your life? You are now doing things with your mobile phone, maybe with a fitness tracker, with some technology in your car, in your digital home. You are now doing things that 10 years ago, I promise you, many of you said, I will never do that. And yet you do it all the time. When Facebook first started, actually when YouTube first started around the same time, I got a call from a newspaper reporter. Remember newspapers, right? They, yeah. The newspaper reporter said, why would anyone put their personal videos of their children on the internet? This will never work. Now, I'll admit, I wasn't sure what the business model of YouTube would be, but I knew the psychology of YouTube was guaranteed to work. And now people put up billions of hours of videos on YouTube every week. Consumer hyper-adoption simply describes the way that we as consumers are willing to try new things now, faster and with fewer concerns than we used to. I could go into much more detail. There's some psychology behind it. There's actually some neuroscience that helps explain it. But consumer hyper-adoption, we know, has changed literally billions of lives. There are a billion people using Facebook this day, today, and every day. There are a, more than a billion people who use Android in a typical month, whether their phone, their tablet, or some other device. There are more than a billion people who use the messaging platform WhatsApp every single month. Now, a billion people. Is that 150 Norways piled up? That is a lot of people. In the history of the world, we've never seen anything like this. In fact, in history, only three things have ever had a billion users. They are China, India, and the Catholic Church. None of those were particularly cheap to build. Profitable? I don't know. It's hard to say. What's going to be next on the Billion User Club? Actually, technically, Facebook Messenger itself now has a billion users and it's only four years old. This was not possible before hyper-adoption. You see, before hyper-adoption, people heard about something new. Maybe they heard about it on the news. Maybe a friend told them about it. And they thought, that's interesting. But they didn't go look for more information. And the next time they heard about it, they thought, that's still interesting. And I'll wait a couple years to see if that's going to be useful to me. And a couple years later, maybe it would be. Today, people hear about something new. They consider whether it will be useful to them very quickly, sometimes in days, sometimes in hours. There are some apps that you have downloaded and used after only hearing about them once. One friend said, I'm using this new app. And you said, oh, really? And you downloaded it. Seconds. It took you seconds to make that decision. Why? because the risk of trying that new thing was so low. What do you lose? 10 seconds of your life, no money, and then if you try it and you love it, you keep using it for a couple of weeks maybe. Or if you don't like it, you don't even bother to delete it. You just forget that it's there. That's hyper-adoption in action. And there will be many, many more companies that achieve this kind of power by taking advantage of hyper-adoption. I'm suddenly very uncomfortable because there's a camera right here at my ankle. I feel a little awkward. Okay, I'll move over here. <laughs> Consumer hyper-adoption explains how people behave. But what about companies? That's what digital disruption does. 
Digital disruption, although it has the word digital in it, is not about the technology. Digital disruption is about using technology to do what? To keep up with the consumers. Because consumers are so ready to try new things, you have to have your new thing in front of them very, very rapidly before someone else does. And digital disruption lets you do that at lower cost, in a shorter time, and generally with a more satisfying outcome for the consumer. That's digital disruption. Now, many of you are digital disruptors yourselves, or you want to be, and that's why you're here. That's good. There are plenty of examples of companies that have done this. The most, I would say, famous example around the world that has caused tremendous growth and pain, depending on who you are in the industry, that's Amazon. Now, Amazon is... 20 years old at the beginning of next year, which makes it sound like an old company now. Amazon just this year reached the $100 billion sales mark, faster than any company in history. Makes it the fastest growing large company in history. Now, I'll tell you why they were the fastest growing company, because they used digital tools to deliver better value to their customers, and they did that over and over and over. That's the whole business model. Interestingly, when Jeff Bezos wrote his annual letter to shareholders this year, in the letter he said, congratulate us, we have reached this $100 billion sales mark quicker than any other company. Now I'd like to tell you about a division of Amazon inside the company that reached the $10 billion sales mark faster than the overall company did. So the world's fastest growing large company has a faster growing division inside it. And that's Amazon Web Services. So an interesting question that some of you might have in the room is all of this that you're talking about sounds very friendly to consumers, but what about business to business services? I give you Amazon Web Services. Same business model. Use the technology to serve the customer more quickly and more cheaply. I can't even keep track of how many times Amazon Web Services has cut its prices. They take someone who signed a contract last year and they interrupt them and say, I know your contract's not over yet, but we're going to lower the price you're paying. And they do that all the time. That's digital disruption and the effect of digital disruption. Now, in this world where I'm describing that you will use digital technology to serve hyper-adoptive consumers more effectively than before, how, how do you measure whether you're doing this? How do you know if you're good at this? Gratefully, there has arisen a trend that people are calling customer experience. Now, customer experience has been with us for a long time. At Forrester, we started our customer experience practice 20 years ago, 19, sorry. We didn't call it customer experience, though. We called it usability, as did many of you. And then we called it user interface, and then user experience. So it took us some time before what we realized we're not just talking about whether the website works or whether the mobile app is elegant in its design. We are talking about whether the customer experience you are providing to your customer is going to satisfy them so that you can live like a digital disruptor. These three things work together. Customer experience is essentially your proof that you are serving that customer well. And if your customer experience doesn't rate well, you will not perform well. In fact, after so many years, we've been doing this for nearly 20 years, so many years of CFOs, chief financial officers inside of companies saying, oh sure, it's good to make a nice experience for your customer, everybody wants to do that. But can you really afford it? What's the return on investment of customer experience? So last year, we finally did the research to prove that the return on customer experience investment is massive. 
What you're looking at is a study from 2010 to 2014. We looked at revenue growth in hundreds of companies across dozens of industries. I've just selected four industries to illustrate this point. At Forrester, we have something called the Customer Experience Index. It's a tool we've had for nearly a decade in which we've evaluated the customer experience of hundreds of companies around the world. We take those who are in the top and those who are in the bottom and we compare their revenue growth. And this is what we see. It's different in different types of industries, which makes sense. But it's also a universal truth that the customer experience leaders earn more money than the customer experience laggards. Now well, that is wonderfully intuitive and now we can prove it. Now, why is that? Is it because the design of your website or your mobile app is so elegant that customers keep coming back? No. It's because the value you deliver to the customer is better than the value that someone else delivers to the customer. Because the customer experience facilitates the delivery of value from dis digital disruptor to hyper-adoptive consumer and facilitates the ongoing connection between the two. That is how these three things work together as an ongoing force. And the power of these things is so great. Think of it as not this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then we're done. Think of this as a kind of force, uh, an engine that keeps running, and the more it runs, the faster it goes. In all of our studies, we are finding that consumers go through this experience of being satisfied, and what happens? Do you think that the consumer says, oh, you've taken care of me, I'm done now. I won't expect anything else neat in the future. Of course not, you are consumers. You know that the next thing that happens is you say, that was really good. What more do you have for me? And this is happening in every industry. Expectations of value are rising in every consumer space possible. And I just participated in a B2B conference where IBM actually was sponsoring this event and they were saying that they're seeing the same thing, of course, inside the organization, not only in your B2B relationships, where your B2B customer has consumer expectations because their consumer lives are so simple and then they walk into your relationship with you as a B2B services provider and they want it to be just as elegant, but also the B to E, business to employee relationship. Employees now walk in the door and most of them don't walk in such a nice door as this one. And they walk in the door and the first thing they say is, why is my work technology so bad? So everyone's expectations are rising in every domain of their lives and psychologically, there's no evidence that that will stop. So the more consumers will want this, the more we have to continue to learn how to do it. The more we have to not just say, yay, digital, let's make an app, but instead have to say, what are the fundamental changes in our organization that need to occur so that we can serve that customer today and tomorrow and the day after? So these forces, in my opinion, lead to not just a new investment in digital, but a very fundamental business shift. And because I spend a lot of my time with marketers and CMOs in particular, I want to explain how I tell it to them. I say, remember the old days of marketing. It looked like this. Marketing led to sales, led to transactions of some kind, depending on the business, which led to some kind of customer support. It was a linear chain or process, and when it was done, the customer started over next time they needed something from us. Well, today, I think Tesla is a good example of this. We just take marketing completely out of it. If you know what Tesla did, 
And those of you with cameras, I'm going to have you wait because it's going to get better. <laughs> Today, what Tesla has done is said, you know what? We start selling the car the moment we tell you that it even exists. We're supporting you now for a two year long transaction because we can't make the car for two years. So now we as marketers have to continue to talk to you through that two year transaction. And then after you buy the car, we're going to upgrade the software in your car every couple of weeks. So what is the role of marketing in this environment? It's end to end support of that entire process. The customer, a single known and named customer through that whole process is known by marketing. In fact, the word marketing doesn't work anymore because so many of us are stuck thinking of marketing as a lead generation or an awareness building or just a brand building exercise. Marketing needs to do so much more. So I'm actually going to change that again. It's now end to end relationship support. And that's really what's happening here as a result of digital. And I'll just pause while the cameras take the picture. <laughs> Remember this point. We are saying goodbye to marketing and hello to customer relationships. But very quickly you realize the marketing team can't actually do that. They don't know everything about this process and you're right. The future of this kind of marketing, this kind of relationship support is a complete operational model for the company where everyone in the company now has the customer relationship at the center of their process and their job. So just to summarize in the world of hyper adoption, digital disruption and customer experience, companies must change their customer relationships. And this is a topic we could talk about for several hours. I'll try and keep it to just two or three. Well, let's start with this example. Now this, it's an, it's an easy one to use. I could use any number of examples, but this one I think is important to talk about. If you are familiar with the Amazon Echo, now this is a device that has been on sale in the United States for about a year and is just this week, just started shipping yesterday in the UK and arrives in Germany next week sometime. So three current markets and Amazon intends to expand it over time. What it is to begin with is a speaker that plays music. That sounds really boring. But it also has seven microphones in it. And seven microphones are in there so that they can tell where the sound is coming from. And when I say Alexa, which is the name that wakes it up, it can tell where I am in the room and start to listen in that direction and block out sound from other directions. We do this in my home all the time with the kids who are making noise over here. And I say Alexa, and she has to focus on me. At first, it was a music player, Alexa, play the Beatles. And Alexa would play the Beatles. I could ask for specific songs, I could ask for specific artists or playlists. But then very quickly, Amazon began to add new features. Now the important thing to understand is these are not actually product features. Because this is not a product. It's a relationship platform. In our conversation a little later, we'll talk about how you define relationship in this environment. But this is a good example to get us into the idea of what this relationship platform looks like. Let's examine that. So you come to Alexa one day and you say, play aha. I am from that generation. We could karaoke this later on, I'd love to. I can't hit those high notes though. He was really good at those high notes. Okay, in my home we also hear what's the weather a lot because the kids want to know whether they have to wear a coat to school or not. I have a nine-year-old so I hear, Alexa, tell me a joke. Oh, six or eight times a day I hear this. I know every joke Alexa knows how to tell. In January, after testing this for nearly a year, Amazon realized nobody really wants to use Amazon Music. The Amazon Music service wasn't good enough. 
it doesn't have all the music that you want. So they said, is this a product or is this a relationship? It's a relationship. Let's use that relationship to give value to this customer. Let's let Spotify in to Amazon Echo. And so biggest competitor possible now gets a free pass right into this environment so that people can say, Alexa, play AHA on Spotify. And it works. Next, they added pizza. Alexa, order me pizza. Now you have to have already arranged your account with Amazon and Domino's, both. But once you authenticate that relationship, Amazon can order you a pizza from Domino's and then it can update you. So you say, Alexa, where is my pizza? She calls the API that goes into Domino's with your account, finds out that your pizza is in the oven and says aloud, your pizza is in the oven, it will be here in 20 minutes. That's information that Domino's already has in their system. All Alexa has to do is call that information and ask for it. The same is true for Uber. Alexa can order an Uber. And any number of skills that marketers are now adding, there are now thousands of these skills. They're not called apps, they're called skills. And you have to enable them as a user and then you can call on them in the ways that I've just illustrated. So let me tell you, we've been doing survey work on Amazon since 1997, the year they started. Back when a tiny fraction of the US population was shopping on Amazon, which was its first market. In those early days, buyers at Amazon shopped once or twice a year. Over the years, that number grew. It grew to three to four a year, then six to eight a year. And then it became monthly, 12 times a year. You get up to 2010 and people who shop there are shopping there even once a week. What Amazon has achieved with Alexa is people interacting with the brand a dozen times a day. Now, most of those interactions don't generate revenue for Amazon. But the relationship, as it gets deeper, delivers tremendous revenue for Amazon. The people who have these deepest relationships with Amazon, two things about them. We're just publishing actually next week an analysis of the last year's worth of shopping data in the US. The people who are most connected to Amazon, including these people who have Amazon Echo, which right now is about four million people. Those who are most connected to Amazon spend three times as much money online than the people who do not have that connection. It's a small fraction of the population that has a huge influence on online transactions and engagement. So this is one relationship that is worth investing in just because of who those people are, not to mention what other services you can get them to buy over time. That's the power of relationship. Now, here's a trick though. How do you think about a relationship? A relationship, it's a singular word. A relationship. It implies this kind of wonderful thing. But a relationship is comprised of moments. And your relationship has to win your customer's attention moment after moment after moment after moment. And this is challenging for marketers. We, we, we call what we're entering right now the post-digital era. First of all, we're calling it post-digital because we want people to stop thinking that digital is a piece of their business. Their whole business has to be digital. So eventually we'll stop saying it. But for now, digital. In a post-digital world, it's not like it was when I was growing up. The pre-digital era was the one-to-many world where you had one message, one television ad, one newspaper ad, and it just went out to the world and you hoped that a certain number of people would come back and buy your product or use your service, and that's how it was done. Then we entered digital. 
And digital seemed very exciting because for the first time we were one to one. We could actually send a personalized email, dear James, here are the flowers we think that your wife will love. We're not really in a one-to-one -one place right now. It's more like one to 1.2 or three, but we're a lot closer than we used to be pre-digital, and that's exciting. Companies know me as an individual, but here's where it gets tricky. In the post-digital environment, we are now talking about one-to-moment marketing. Okay, we know who you are, James, but here's who you are right now. Here's who you are tomorrow morning. Here's who you are when you pull out your phone at the airport versus here's who you are when you're sitting at home after having just put the kids to bed. I need to, as a marketer, understand not just you, but your moment. And knowing customers in their moments, what we call moments of need, this is the next big challenge for companies. And I was about to say challenge for marketing, but remember, I'm not just talking about marketing. Because in a world where marketing means end-to-end -end customer relationship support, one-to-moment is the responsibility for knowing the customer through that whole relationship. And then, of course, how well those moments convert into a relationship depends on something. Not everybody can do it, or not everyone will do it successfully. And I want to share with you three keys to a deeper digital relationship with the customer. Those things are frequency, emotion, and convenience. Now, we've seen all of these in operation today as we have talked about Amazon with the Echo, taking frequency from once a year to 12 times a day. That's a remarkable achievement. Important, though, is that you understand that emotion is actually the key subsystem in the brain that motivates people to come back to something that they did before, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a product or a service or a place or an experience. It is emotion that gets tagged onto something that we did, stored in long-term memory, and when we recall that place or that person or that experience, the emotion brings it back and motivates us to desire that thing, if it was a good emotion. It motivates us to avoid that thing if it was a bad emotion. So simply getting people to interact with you 12 times a day is nice, but having them interact with you and feel good about it. And that's even better. This is a very complex topic. We've just done some extremely interesting research that we'll be publishing early next year where we're looking at among the, I'll call them 20 different emotional states or categories of emotions that are generally accepted by researchers and psychologists, which ones are most likely to correlate with satisfaction as a customer. You see, most people who study emotion study it as you're happy or you're sad. It's good or it's bad. And that is true. That is a true dimension of emotion. But there are different emotions for a reason. We don't just feel happy or sad. We can feel nostalgic or melancholy. And some of those emotions motivate us in different ways than others. So this is going to be a very exciting area that I'll be leading our research over the next couple of years. Convenience, of course, you know. And I put it last because I don't actually want you to just focus on convenience. Yes, remove the friction from your customer relationship. That's absolutely crucial. But you've got to be giving someone something that they want to do frequently and with a level of emotion. Otherwise, just making it easy. Making it easy to do a bad thing or a wrong thing or an uninteresting thing is not actually useful. So these things, there are examples of these. I've already mentioned Amazon. How they rapidly and repeatedly keep adding new things to get people more excited, even if it means working with a competitor or a completely unrelated business like pizza. And who knows what they'll add next, but this has become part of the brand experience now. Every Friday afternoon, 
people who own the Echo get an email from Amazon saying, these are the new things this week that your Echo can do. Isn't this exciting? And developers who develop skills for the Echo tell us that Friday afternoon they see a huge spike. As people come home, they're ready to relax, and they just talk to Alexa. That sounds sad, I know. <laughs> I actually, I will share that I have one client whose wife won't let him talk to Alexa. She calls Alexa the other woman. And he said, well, she kind of is. She listens to me. She does what I ask. I said, I don't want to know any more. Stop. But this ability to keep adding things, it's one of the hallmarks of digital disruptors. They don't content themselves to build a new experience and just make that experience amazing, although many of them do that as well. They then say, from this place, this relationship that we have, what else could we do? Not what completely different business could we do, but what else that's immediately adjacent to where I am in this customer relationship? What else could I add? And that's the power of seeking frequency is that it sometimes leads you, actually not sometimes, very often leads you into someone else's business. And go back through all of the digital disruptors you've heard of that have been most successful and you see that they keep doing this. They keep sneaking into other people's businesses. Now, emotion, I've already talked a little bit about emotion. I'll put Starbucks up as an example of a company that manages to make coffee emotional. So much so that people pay a premium for it. They prefer to buy their coffee at Starbucks. And they value the experience of Starbucks because they've assigned all of these positive emotions to it. And this is an important success ingredient for Starbucks. Part of what you need to do with emotion is help people anticipate. So if I said to you that Emotion is how we remember things so that we come back and do them again. That's true after the thing that we've done. But we still have to have, in our motivational apparatus, we have to have something that makes us do the new thing for the first time. And emotion is a critical part of that. We write about this, we call it anticipatory CX, or anticipatory customer experience. Some companies are amazing at this. Starbucks is one. Tesla is another. Disney is perhaps the easiest example. Disney, if you are a target customer of theirs, and I won't presume that you are, but if you are, they start telling you the story of how amazing your Disney vacation is going to be long before you're even there. In fact, when you're still researching, they start to talk to you as if you are already a guest and they paint the picture in words and in images of what it will feel like to be their customer. If you go ahead and book that vacation, they already know the ages of your children, they know who their favorite Disney characters are, and they mail you Disney magic bands, or little wearable technology bracelets that have your child's favorite character on them, six weeks in advance. So now they're building the anticipation they're setting the emotional stage so that when you arrive, all you have to do is play out the script that Disney has written and your emotions will be fulfilled. That's the story that they tell and it works for their target customer. You think of your favorite emotionally connective brands, whether you know it or not, they're telling you a story and it's a story you want to believe. That's anticipation. Of course, then you have to deliver satisfaction. You actually have to make the experience as good as you said it would be. Do that as quickly and as consistently as possible over multiple relationship touch points and you will engage emotion. Now convenience, of course, as I said, is a foundation of digital. It has always been one of the reasons that digital is successful. It is, in fact, a reason that people will now pay a a premium to engage with more convenient brands. I am so sorry for those of you who have this sun right in your eyes. <laughs> Feel free to move around. There's some seats up here. In the world of convenience, part of the psychology of convenience is not just to make something so easy to do. That's part of it, yes. 
But it's also about learning to promise what it is you will make convenient. If you promise to make 28 things convenient, by definition, you cannot. I like to think of my bank's website. And my bank, very large bank in the United States, has had a website for many years. And for all those years, every time I log in, they show me the 67 things that I could do on that bank website. In the history of my relationship with them, I have only ever done four. But they're trying to say, look, we can make these 67 things convenient for you. And by very definition, that means that you have already not made it convenient for me. Convenient for me would be I log in and they say, James, welcome back. These are the four things you always do with us. Which one are you ready to do today? We think it's this one because we've been paying attention. That's convenient. So part of convenience is promising to do, I'll say, one thing well or a small set of things well. Focus on doing those things that people most value and do those things so incredibly well. Then you can worry about the next thing that they might do. I put Airbnb up here because this is a company that has done a very good job of saying, we're only good at this one thing, and that is helping you find a stranger's bedroom to sleep in. <laughs> That's not creepy at all. And it's not because they've made it really easy to overcome all of the natural concerns and fears that you might bring to that kind of relationship or, or transaction. They've used all the right digital tools. They've made the experience very convenient. And here, just to make this clear, I said a little while ago, you have to constantly look for the next thing you can do. Uh, it doesn't mean that Airbnb is going to suddenly get into leasing out office space, although who knows. But within their one thing we do, they're going to keep adding new features to make that thing even easier and even better. And pretty soon, they've built the future of the business by simply doing that one thing really, really well, and then doing it again. So these three keys, frequent, emotional, and convenient, what do these look like when they're put into a relationship? We can talk about, in fact, think about your personal relationships maybe. No, maybe don't. Uh, in your customer relationships, a couple of things to think about. This means that, first of all, just to come back to an early point I made, digital is just a fancy word that means that you are ready to serve the customer's moment wherever and whenever. Now, to indicate that willingness to have permission to do that, you have to be in a relationship. You have to have the systems and tools in place so that as soon as the customer says, I'm interested, you can say, and we're here. Here's what we have for you. Here's what we know. And how can we help you next? Digital lets you do that. That's as we'll see, really, really dependent on data and analytics to make any of this happen. So digital makes that happen, but digital isn't the reason we're doing any of this. It's the customer relationship that makes us do it. Along the way, the interfaces themselves are going to get more and more natural. The idea that I'm interacting with you digitally will actually fall to the back and the sense of human or humanity will come back to the front. So right now, I think, oh, I love your app, company. Thank you for having this app for me. And now your company is this app. But really, what you want me to imagine is that I have a relationship with you, the brand, the company, the experience, and that the device just happens to be there. Well, interfaces themselves are just about to make this change so that we will now be in a place where I'll just say, Alexa, how am I going to get to Oslo next week? Well, next week is wrong, two weeks ago. It's in two weeks. See, an Alexa will go through my calendar. She'll look at everything that I have done in the past, where I have stayed in Oslo in the past. She'll look and see who I'm meeting with and their address. She'll look at all those things. And then she'll come back to me and say, I found three hotels that would be good for you, one of which I've, you've stayed in before. Would you like to hear more from those brands? And then suddenly, she hands me to one of those brands that she has pre-selected. Oh, wow, that should scare us as marketers. When Alexa is making the first decision for me about which brand to talk about, to talk to, 
but that's a more natural interface. For me to have to pull up an app and say, oh, should I look at the Radisson? Should I look at Scandic? Should I look and see? Is really not the right solution for me. So as the interface becomes more natural and digital falls to the back, those companies that can speak naturally and interact naturally with their customers will have the advantage. We're seeing this in chatbots right now. There are thousands of chatbots now on Facebook Messenger. Earlier this year, Facebook opened up its messaging platform and made it possible for anyone to put a chatbot on Messenger. And most of them are terrible. That's the way it usually goes the first time. But what we're seeing is quickly people are starting to appreciate the value of starting a conversation with a customer as opposed to sending them a notification or an email. Who looks at their inbound email anymore? So you could send an email and hope they read it. You could put a notification on the app and hope that among the 20 other notifications they have to go through that they'll choose to look at yours, which then they have to wait for the app to open and get to the screen. Sounds like a lot of hassle. It's embarrassing that we are so spoiled. Or it's just easier if in my messaging thread up pops a message from that brand that I have a relationship with that says, hey, I heard from Alexa that you're going to Oslo. While you're there, I think you ought to stay at this Radisson. And let me show you the running paths close by because I know that's something you like to do. Suddenly, I'm in a conversation with the brand. The brand knows me, and they know how to reach me in a way that's appropriate to my moment and the future moment I hope to have when I'm in the hotel. So serving people in these moments will mean anticipating the meaning of that moment. The example I just gave you is a very relevant one for me. When I look at hotels, I look at where are the running paths close to the hotel. I would really, really love it if the hotels would finally realize that's a decision criterion for me, and maybe only me, but fine. And then would anticipate that that is meaningful to me, because if it weren't, I wouldn't do it everywhere I go, and I do it everywhere I go. So it must mean something to James. There's emotion. It means something. Let's see if we can anticipate that meaning and deliver the right experience in a natural way that meets his needs both his need to book that hotel and his need to enjoy that hotel when it comes. You imagine I show up at the hotel and up pops the chat bot. Hey, it looks like you're at the hotel. Just a reminder, the spa closes at 11. All of that personalized to me in a way that a human being could do if a human being were magic. But isn't it amazing if I walk into the hotel and go check in and the person on the other side says, oh, Alexa told us you were coming. Here's a little map for you of the running path that we think you're interested in. And there are human beings here that would love to help you if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. So that kind of natural conversation, that is a completely new interface for how to talk to, talk with, experience with your customer. And it's coming very, very soon. Uh, just actually this week, I've been in two large meetings with innovation teams at large companies here in the Nordics that are working on their chatbot strategy. It's a terrible name, by the way. I hate the name. Think of it better as the conversation strategy. What is our conversation strategy? How will we talk to and with our customers? And if you use a chatbot to do it today, that's fine. But tomorrow, you might use a microphone to do it. And then in the future, we were just having a report uh, collaboration process with some of my colleagues at Forrester. We're talking about virtual agents. Imagine if Alexa just isn't a disembodied voice or the representative of the Radisson here in Oslo isn't just a text message, but is actually a very attractive Norwegian person, of which you have a lot of them, I've noticed. You guys are so healthy. Good for you. We're not quite there. But if there's a virtual agent who comes in and says, hey, I'd love to talk you through whether our hotel can meet your needs and whether the running paths, all of those things. But it's a virtual person that I'm seeing through my HoloLens glasses when they get smaller. This is not far away. 
before suddenly we're having virtual conversations that feel as useful as having a personal assistant or butler in your life. Will there be unemployment for butlers in the future? I think there already is unemployment for butlers right now, but let's imagine it's going to get worse. But the opportunity to be a useful assistant to people is going to explode. The kind of care and service that only the wealthiest people, only royalty got in past, now average people will have access to. Not everybody in the world, not yet. But average people like me, yes. So how do I do this? That's an important question that we turn our time to. I need to ask Eric, when am I done? I can, I can do this for hours. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. 10? Perfect. Good, good. I can wrap this up then. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, if you want me to say invest in this technology and this service and this vendor, I won't because this is not about technology. In fact, the biggest obstacles are internal. When we ask people, we've surveyed all around the globe, every time we do a survey that's like the one I'm going to show you now, the results come out almost identical. Number one, do you believe that digital is changing your business? Yes, 89% say yes. Number two, do you get excited about that as a company? Does your company want this to happen? Mostly yes, 65% say yes. Then we say, all right, do you have the skills that you need to make this happen? And the answer gets a little more discouraging, 38% feel like they have the skills. And that could be a problem. It is a problem. Talent actually is one of the biggest concerns on all of our global executives that we survey every year. Talent, culture, that's all important. But I actually think it's worse than that when we ask this question. Do you have the formal policies and informal practices in your company that will allow you to do this? And the answer is no, 32%. And the cameras go up. I'll pose. <laughs> What's fascinating about this number is that if I split it into people who are vice presidents and above versus the people who work for them, the vice presidents, interestingly, are much more confident. The policies that I made, oh, they're great. 49% say yes. The people that work for them don't agree. 24% think that the policies are right. Now, think about this. Policy is formal practice. The informal practice, that's very important. And that's probably, in my opinion, as big a problem. And in some of the research that we've done, just recently, actually, a survey that we fielded in Germany, the UK, and the US, we found that, statistically speaking, culture is a much bigger predictor of whether you will be able to serve your customers better in the future than any other variable in your current operating model. Now, all those variables are related, so it's not that you only have to worry about culture. You have to do all of these things so that the culture can improve, but in the end, you have to tell your culture we are not good enough and we need to improve. And that's a really hard thing for most companies to do. You don't know what ways to improve. You don't know how bad off you are. It's so much easier as a leader to just say, we're doing a good job, we'll try a little harder. But 24% of people agree that trying a little harder is good enough. Everybody else thinks you need to dramatically change your policies and your practices. So what does that look like? Last note I'll leave you with is something about the power of leaders. Now this can be the most senior leaders, and I hope it is. It can be any leader in the organization. Anyone who has a role where they motivate and influence other people, which hopefully, in the right culture, ends up being everyone. There are five things that our research has shown, five behaviors that leaders can engage in that will improve the organization's readiness and willingness to serve their customers. So that when they get a digital tool, the first thing that they think about is, what is this going to do for that customer? That's the attitude that we want to have. I'll say these things quickly. One, you have to be obsessed with measuring your effect on your customer, measuring the connection, the relationship that you have 
You have to be constantly refining these metrics. You have to be referring to the results of those metrics in your meetings internally rather than just your quarterly sales numbers. And then when you do measure how well your teams are performing in customer outcomes, you reward them for it publicly. You tell everyone else in the organization, this is what we do to people who serve our customers well. They get some kind of reward. That's a very complicated field, but it has to be happening at least on some level. Then finally, or not finally, next, I use the word unblock, uh, it's a terrible word. It really means remove obstacles. That when someone comes to you and says, there's something here that's broken, there's a customer problem, there's a problem in our process and it's impacting customers, instead of saying, I don't know, that's that department's problem and there's gonna be so much politics if we bring it up, they'll think that we're complaining about them and they'll take it personally. We'll just leave it, which is what usually happens. But if you're the kind of leader who says, that's a problem that really needs to be solved, I'm going to remove all of this barrier between knowing that there's a problem and solving that problem so that we can just solve the problem. And there are companies that do this very well, but they have to make it a conscious effort. They have to train their employees. I actually know one bank, the Bank of Montreal in Canada, that has a formal system where if you see a problem that is not under your responsibility, you log it, and then you become the steward, or the caretaker of that problem. The system goes and connects to the people who might be able to solve it. They then are on the hook to try to solve it. And when it gets solved, the person who solved it and the person who brought it up both get rewarded. And so the system encourages people to find things that need to be fixed for the customer, and everybody feels good about it. That's removing obstacles. The easiest one to do is actually model. This is when executives themselves, instead of talking about internal processes and internal concerns, what do we want next, are constantly asking the question, what does our customer want next? What's the next thing that they might want from us? And how do they get evidence for that? They're actually trying to show empathy for the customer. They're trying to be a customer. Do you know how many boardrooms I have gone into and asked people, do you use your own website? And the hands go down. The executives in the room don't need to use their own websites, not for their own personal lives, but for their careers, they should. And I tell them to. And then I tell them to talk about it. I tell them to go in their own stores or fly on their own planes or try to resolve a customer service problem without telling anyone who they are and live like their own customers. We've got good examples of that, that we're seeing more and more CEOs walking into their own places of business and acting like a customer to see what it feels like. The last one of these five is provide, and this simply means resources, and this is the hardest part because it involves budgeting. Providing means providing time, people, or money and eventually probably all three. And how many times have you seen something that needs to be fixed but it didn't get fixed because someone said we don't have budget for that this cycle? Bring it up in November and we'll see if we can get money approved for next year. Happens all the time. So I met recently with one financial services uh, chief technology officer and she has a secret. She has a piece of her budget that nobody knows about. She doesn't tell anyone. And it's just there so that when someone brings up an urgent problem that needs to be fixed, she says, how much will that cost? And they say, well, it'll take a year and it'll cost half a million dollars. She says, what if I had you fix it in six weeks? What would you do and how much would it cost? And they think she's just being silly. They say, well, I think I could do it for $85,000, but it would look like this. And she'd say, how robust would it be? Would it be good? And they say, well, yeah, I think you could. And she says, all right, go do it. Because she has the budget already set aside. She lured them into the trap. They thought they would bring up a problem someone else would solve, and she turns around and lets them solve it. Now they're happy because they feel motivated at work. They feel like they work for an organization that knows how to do all this and provides resources to satisfy customer needs. There are companies that do this well. I mentioned CEOs that walk into their places of business. This is one. 
This is John Timpson. He's the former CEO, now chairman of Timpson in the UK. Timpson is a locksmith and shoe repair company. Not the most, I'd say, advanced digital industry. Timpson is a man who visits every single one of his stores at least once in a three-year period, which means every single business day he has to be in some store to get to all of them. When he walks in the door, he's unannounced, nobody knows he's coming, he walks in the door, the first thing he does is look for a customer. And if they're not being helped, he'll walk over and say, how can I help you? They don't know he's the CEO. Now, in order to do that, he has to know his products. He has to know his customer experience metrics. He has to know how to use the point of sale system. He has to know the business. But by doing that, it means that the people in the store see their CEO caring about customers first. And it lets them care about customers first as well. So in the world of trying to do these five things, we recently did a small survey with a number of our clients that I'll share with you in a second to see how well people are doing these things. We also did a large international survey that we'll be publishing later where we have more interesting data behind it. But just a quick look, it looks like this. 41% of our leaders believe that they model this behavior. Now, that's great. I personally believe that they're not doing it as frequently as I want them to. Because when I ask for detail, people say, oh yeah, I, I do that. And I say, how often? Uh, maybe not every month. It needs to become regular and routine. But it is the easiest one to do. So I say, start there. If you already do it, do it more. Because it's infectious. It makes other people want to do it too. And then it goes down the line. Rewarding and measuring are very tied together because you can't really reward people that you're not, where you don't have measurements that you can use as the basis for your reward. Removing obstacles in the organization, that gets harder. And then, of course, providing resources is the hardest of all. Not a surprise. So we have our work cut out for us. It also means if you feel like you can be the one who does this, you've got an opportunity because you'll be one of the only ones who can do this. And this will differentiate you in your individual career as well as the effect you have on your company, which is something you want. So I didn't even tell you a single technology to invest in. I guess I hinted at chatbots. There will be virtual reality. The point is, all of those things you will have to try and experiment with, but if you will do it with an eye to serving your customer relationship, how do you make it frequent, emotionally connective, and convenient as possible? How do you then anticipate the needs that someone will have that you can fulfill and serve those needs in the moment? That's your opportunity. That's innovation in the future of digital, even though the technology becomes less and less obvious, the results for our hyper-adoptive customers becomes all the more apparent. And so with that, I thank you for your time and your attention.